this dramatic music. So my plan was to fast this whole week so that I could give you a really good message to make sure that we can grasp more of this book of Revelation. I didn't, but, um, but what I realized, and I, yeah, I, what I've realized this week is the, it's almost like it feels j just this, this reverence of God and just understanding that when we come to the scriptures, when we start to read this book, the point is for Jesus to be revealed. The point is for us to see him, to, to see who he is. And so when we look at this book, I uh, I first just want to pray for us, and Lord, I, I thank you for this worship, the worship that we had this morning, Jesus. I, Lord, I thank you just for your presence. I thank you, Lord, for, for who you are. I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you allow us to know you, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that even as this morning, as we, as we look into your scriptures, that we would see you, Lord, that we'd walk away knowing you more, standing more in awe of you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, just a few things when we, just to remind us when we come to the book of Revelation is that it's not written in chronological order, like this is going to happen and then this is going to happen. It's more like Ch um, Matt Chandler explains it as windows, that we look into different aspects of what God is saying. And John, when he's writing this revelation, he's more concerned about the who and the, and the why rather than the how and the when. So, so often when we come, we want to know the how and we want to know the when. But when we start to know the who and the why, the how and the when are not so important. Matt Chandler also says the plain things are the main things and the main things are the plain things. The plain things are the main things. And I want to encourage you, over the past two weeks, um, Malcolm has done a phenomenal job of unpacking the first part of Revelation. Last week, I was sitting on the edge of my seat, just so captivated by what the Lord said in the first part of Revelation. And I want to encourage you to go and have a listen and, and really take hold, because the Bible says that blessed is the person that reads this book. So have you been reading this book as we have been journeying through it? I want to encourage you to read it, even if it's, it's difficult to understand. Keep reading it and reading it because there is a blessing that awaits. Now, before we go into Revelation 4, I want us to just look at the end of Revelation 3. And I find something very fascinating about the end of Revelation 3. Jesus says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. And what I find fascinating when you go and listen to what Malcolm shared last week about the churches and Jesus walking through the churches with this plumb line, what I find amazing is that Jesus is knocking at the door of the churches. As he is knocking at the door of your life today, he's knocking. And he's saying, if you open the door, I will come in and we'll share a meal together as friends. And so as we look at Revelation 4, what I find fascinating is that what we'll see is Jesus is knocking on the door of the churches, and yet the throne room door stands open. The throne room door stands open. And as we look at this throne room in Revelation 4, we're going to answer some questions. We're going to answer the question, where is this throne room? Who is on the throne? 
what is around the throne, what comes from the throne, what is behind the throne, what is before the throne, what is happening in this throne room. And Revelation 4 starts, and I'm going to read the whole scripture because I believe it's important for us to be reading the scriptures. And it says in verse 1, then as I looked, so this is John, as he's sitting on the island of Patmos, he says, then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice I heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. So through Revelation, John is, throughout, as we look at this book, you'll see that John, he's in heaven, and then he's on earth, and then he sees how what happens in heaven affects what's taking place on the earth. Okay, and it's important for us to remember what, remember this, what happens in heaven affects what's happening down on earth. So let's answer the two questions, where is the throne and what is on the throne? Verse 2, and instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian, and the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. So during the Middle Ages, people used to write maps to try and discover where heaven was. And some of them thought maybe heaven is behind the stars or maybe it's beyond the moon. If we could just travel out into space, perhaps we could get to heaven. And others of them would draw these maps to try and find where is heaven. Let's, let's try and discover heaven. But as you see in this instance, John is sitting on the island of Patmos and in an instant... He finds himself in heaven, in the throne room, in the presence of God. So heaven is near, and heaven touches everything that we see today, and he's there in an instance. The throne is the epicenter of ultimate reality. So what we're seeing here and now, we think what we touch and feel is real. But do you know that the throne room is more real? The throne room is eternal. And it's not some mystical, weird thing. And as we look further, I'm hoping that this will become a bit more plain to us. So what is on the throne? The throne of heaven, first of all, is occupied. The throne of heaven is occupied. And when John is in this throne room, it's like he struggles to he tries to describe what he is seeing. And that's why as we look into Revelation, there's a lot of imagery, there's a lot of symbolism. And so it's John trying to describe, like how do you describe God? And he's saying he's like Ruby, he's like Cornelian, he's like, and if you read into this, um, I'm sure as you study it, and you, you, there's different scholars believe that this means this, and this means that, and this stone, but we're not going to go into that today. But what I want us to realize is that John is absolutely captivated by the one that is seated on the throne, the sovereign one, the almighty one that is seated on this throne. And then he sees this rainbow, it's like a rainbow encircling him, and we could say that that's speaking of a God that keeps his promises, a God of promise. Then in verse 4, 24 thrones surrounded him and 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, it speaks about the, when the good shepherd appears, he's speaking to the elders, and he says, I will, I will give you a crown of never-ending glory. And most scholars agree that these, or a lot of scholars agree that these thrones speak of the 12 tribes. They could represent the 12 tribes and then the 12 disciples. But what it's actually saying is it's in, it's, it, it includes all of humanity. All of humanity is represented in this throne room. So what comes from the throne? What is in front of the throne? Verse 5, from the throne come flashes of lightning and rumbles of thunder. And in front of the throne are seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. Now the New Living Translation says the sevenfold spirit of God. Some other translations say the seven spirits of God. Now it's important to remember that there's only one Holy Spirit. And when we see numbers in the book of Revelation, these numbers usually represent something. And the number seven represents perfection, represents completion. So that's, it's not that there are seven spirits. 
There's one Holy Spirit, but what I like about the New Living is it speaks about the sevenfold Spirit of God. And when we read in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. So it's the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So it's speaking about the Holy Spirit, this perfect complete Holy Spirit. Then in verse 6, in front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. Now in those times when John was writing, um, the Jews were afraid of the sea, and they were afraid of what lurked under the sea. The sea was a fearful place. It wasn't like us that go and go visit the beach. They were scared of the sea. And now the fact that the sea is like glass before the throne would possibly represent the fact that God makes stillness out of chaos. They would see the, the sea as this chaotic place, not knowing what was underneath. But in God, there is safety. In God, there is no danger. And that is, that is possibly what, now remember when I say possibly, because it doesn't say this represents this, this represents this, this is what a lot of the scholars have felt and agreed on so what is in the center and around the throne? In the center and around the throne, and this is what Cherie read this morning, were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and is still to come. And next week, we are going to look at Revelation chapter 5, but I just want to read verse 13 because it, it actually links to this verse, and it says, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing, and honor, and glory, and might, and strength, forever and ever. So I wanted to put some pictures up, but when I found pictures of these, these lions with wings, and oxes with wings, and you, can get, you find some very strange looking pictures, and I didn't want to freak everybody out, but what this represents is that all creation is fixed, has their attention fixed on this throne. So when we start to worship in church, we're not starting worship. Worship is already taking place. Right now, as you are sitting here, worship is taking place in the throne room. And these creatures, what we see is the lion. Is the, these creatures, it represents all of the creatures in, cre in creation. We have the lion, the noblest, the ox, the strongest, the man, the wisest, the eagle, the swiftest. And the eyes could represent knowledge and could represent wisdom. And all the eyes are fixed on this throne room. All of creation, all attention, all glory, all affection is on the throne. And like Jesus says in Luke 19, when the Pharisees say to him, why are you allowing the people to praise you? He says, if they don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. So if we don't worship, worship will still take place because it's already taking place. We join the worship. Okay, we, we come into and we say, Lord, oh, we too want to worship you. Worship is taking place. All of creation is worshiping this king. We want to worship you too. We want to join in the worship. So verse 9, whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, then this is what is absolutely beautiful. The 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, and they lay their crowns before the throne and say, 
You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. And so, even though, yes, we will receive crowns, but in light of him, we will lay them down. Because in comparison to him, we don't want our crowns. We want him to have all the glory. We want him to have all, all, all attention should go on to him. And in ancient times, kings and emperors would take off their crowns and they'd, they'd lay it at the feet of the, of the new king in a, in a sense of I sur- we surrender to you. So when we come and we lay our crowns before this king, we are saying, Lord, we surrender. That's a sign of ultimate submission. I submit my whole life to you. So Wright says this. He says, it begins with the unfailing of, unveiling of reality behind the complex and messy confusions of church life in ancient Turkey, behind the challenges of the fake synagogues and the threatening rulers, behind the ambiguous struggles and difficulties of ordinary Christians. There stands the heavenly throne room in which the world's creator and Lord remains sovereign. Only by stopping in our tracks and contemplating this vision can we begin to glimpse the reality which not only makes sense of our own realities, but enables us too to win the victory. And so, what does this mean for us? It's great to know right now worship is taking place, God is on the throne, and heaven is not far away. But what does that mean for us? And I want us to answer three questions just in light of the reality of this throne room, this magnificent throne room. The first is, can we enter this throne room? Can we enter like John? John was in the spirit and he found himself in this throne room. Can we too enter this throne room? The second question is, why should we enter this throne room? Okay, and the third one is, how do we enter the throne room? So I wanna make this quite practical for us. What, like why? Obviously, the first question would have to be yes in order for us to even answer the next two. But firstly, can we? And we find this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It says, So let us come boldly to the throne room of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. So the veil has been torn, the door is open. Jesus is knocking at the door of the churches, but the throne room door stands open for you and I to enter in because of what Jesus did, only because of what Jesus did, because he died in our place. You cannot come into the throne room if you're unholy. You cannot come into the throne room because of your own achievements or because you lived a a good life. I often tell people, I believe that good people go to heaven. I do believe that, but I believe that nobody is good but God. You know, people say, yeah, but this person, they're such a good person. Do they really need Jesus? If God is the definition of good, how do they compare to God? Because that is what good is. And how do you compare to God in terms of you being a good person? That's why we need Jesus. It's only by the blood that he shed that we can be purified from all unrighteousness and we have access to this throne room. Now, the next thing is, why should we enter the throne room? And I want to ask you a question. Why are you here? Why are you in church today? Why do you do what you do? Why do you go to work? Why are you nice to your wife or not? Why are you trying to raise your kids well? Why? What? Why? What is your why? Why enter the throne room? Let's look again at this Hebrews chapter 4. So we read verse 16. But before that, so it says, so, we see the word so, so let us enter God's throne room. That's what it tells us to do. But let's see what it says before that. It says, for the word of God is, from verse 12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. 
it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. What are your innermost thoughts? What are your innermost desires? Imagine we had to take all those innermost thoughts and all those innermost desires and we and everyone could see what they were. I, I would sometimes be a little bit ashamed, a little bit embarrassed by some of my innermost thoughts, some of my innermost desires. Are they holy? Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Nothing. He knows. He knows why you're here. He knows if you were dragged here. He knows if you're coming here because you feel like you need to. He knows why. But nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. God knows your thoughts. God knows your desires. God knows what's going on inside. But I think we need to read a little bit further to help us. Verse 14. So then, since we have a great high priest, this Jesus that died in our place, that shed his blood, who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. So he understands your weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. He did not sin. And then it says, so, so in light of all of this, in light of the fact that right now you're not too keen for all of us to know what your innermost thoughts and desires are, in light of the fact that God knows all things, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, then we will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us in our time of need. Do you know that grace is an empowering thing? It empowers you to not sin. He says that you no longer have to do the things you used to do. Grace empowers you to live a holy life. And that is why we have to be in the throne room. We have to find ourselves in God's presence. That is why. Because your innermost thoughts and your innermost desires need to come under the rulership of this God. So that he can come and he can say, that's not who you are. No, no. Because right now, some of you are sitting and going, oh, I'm ashamed. No, come into the throne room. And, he, and he, what he does is he says, just look at me. Look, look at who I am. Peterson says, failure to worship consigns us to a life of spasms and jerks at the mercy of every seduction, every siren. Without worship, we live manipulated and manipulating lives. Worship does not divide the spiritual from the natural. It coordinates them. So when we worship, when we come into God's presence, he comes and he starts to remove the things that are not of him. He starts to fashion us into his likeness. He starts to show us who we are. And the other day, I, uh, somebody sent me a, a video of these churches in India where people are being, it was a, a video of, of people be, that were blindfolded and they had to just walk and there was just this hole full of dead bodies. And as they would walk, they would fall into the hole and they would shoot them in the head because they believe in Jesus. And as I, as I looked, I thought to myself, I don't, I don't feel sorry for them, I envy them. I envy them and I feel, I said to the Lord, Lord, I, I, I don't have that revelation of you. They have a revelation of you, Jesus, that I lack. And that is the revelation that we are going to need in order to face the world that, that, that lies ahead. 
And I'm not saying, I'm not going to be a prophet of doom and, and all of that. I'm, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is we need a greater revelation of him. And that revelation comes from the throne room. The greater revelation that I have of God's supremacy, the less fear I have. I don't fear the future. I don't fear what's to come. Because I've got a revelation of the throne room. I've got a revelation of what of him and who he is. When I have a greater revelation of him, the more peace I have. The, I no longer need to fight for myself and defend myself and stand up for myself. Because it's okay, as long as he is glorified, as long as people see him. I live a fulfilled life regardless of my bank balance, regardless of my health, because I know what I'm experiencing in this life, in this life is temporary. Scripture tells us, do not look to that which is seen, for that which is seen is temporary. Your bank balance is temporary. Your wrinkles are temporary. Your... I was selling, sharing with someone this morning that at the end I, I'm planning to do a, um, just a display of, of what I felt the Lord saying I should do, um, a dance type of thing, and, and only my one leg can, can lift uh, because I'm, getting, I'm nearly 40. And <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Because the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory, in the light of his grace. And so we, we, the greater revelation we have of the throne room, the less important everything else becomes. And in order to face the future that is to come, we are in desperate need of a greater revelation of the throne room. And he who sits on the throne, the presence of God himself, the reality of the throne room needs to become more of a reality for us in order for us to be victorious. The victorious that, that Jesus spoke about, the way he was victorious and sits with the Father on his throne, he says, you will be victorious and sit with me on my throne. But it's not victorious as in you're getting a good promotion at work and you're earning, your bank balance is going to increase and you going to be prosperous. That, that's not victorious, the victory that he's speaking about. He's speaking about him being seen in your life. He's speaking about you being victorious. To be victorious is to become more like him. He must increase and I must decrease. That's what it means to be victorious. And if the other things happen, if you do get the promotion, it's so that you can represent him in that workplace. If you, want to, if you want a better marriage, take your eyes off of your spouse and get them onto the throne room. If you want to be a better worker, get your eyes off of your, your work and onto the throne room and say, I will do all things for his glory. So how? Let's look at the how. How do we enter this throne room? And I don't know if for some of you during worship, you look around and it looks like some people go to a different place. And you're like, okay, perhaps if I do that, maybe I'll be there. Or perhaps, okay, they're doing this, okay, maybe. And then you try it and you're like, okay, I don't, I don't feel like I'm in another realm yet. What do I need to do in order to get into this new realm? But the scriptures tell us that we will worship him in spirit and in truth. And as we study the scriptures and study the word of God and study who he is, we, our attention, that's what worship is, attention and affection and adoration. That's what worship is. So even if I am, okay, I myself I am an expressive person in worship, but just because my introvert husband next to me is just doing this, doesn't mean that he's experiencing less of Jesus than I am, or that, that I am more spiritual than he is. It's my relationship with Jesus. I, it's, it's part of who I am, but part of who he is is there's a deep knowledge, is attention, adoration of this king. So let's not be looking around and trying to get to this level 
It's this new thing in Christianity. We speak about levels. It's not biblical. It's from the levels are from the devil, I think. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to really go and read, read the whole book of Hebrews, but read the whole of Hebrews chapter 10. And it says, from, I'm just going to read from verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. So it's about your heart. It's about your attention. It's about your adoration. It's about your focus, where you're focusing. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And so I want to speak about worship. Matt Redmond says that worship is revelation and response. God reveals himself and I respond. That, that's what rev worship is, revelation and a response. And now singing is a great part of worship. Okay? Like uh, Malcolm was just sharing in our preacher's meeting that Jesus and his disciples, they sang. In the, we see people singing throughout the scriptures. Angels sing. Paul and Silas sing. Singing is commanded in scripture. Singing is part of worship. It's not all of worship, but singing is a part of worship when we come together in corporate worship and sing. And I know just speaking about individual and corporate worship, I do want to touch on the songs that we listen to. Now, in our church, with regards to corporate worship, the song should focus on him. And a lot of the songs nowadays, it's, days it's about me, and I'm going to be, I'm this, and I. Let's keep our, keep our focus on the king. Let's keep our adoration on the king, because he alone is worthy. And as believers, we need to come together in corporate worship. Even while, while I was worshiping this morning, I got a bit distracted and um, Billy started to shout praises out to God. And as he started to shout, I, my whole body was full. I could feel the tangible presence of God in that moment. And that's why it's so important for us to come together as Christians, to come together as believers, to worship in a corporate sense. There's a corporate anointing, not just me, myself, and Jesus. We need to read our Bibles because that's not what it's about. So when we look around and we see these people going to, sometimes going to these other places, don't, don't worry about that. Just say, Jesus, I want to know you. Jesus, I want to I see you reveal yourself to me. And he will reveal himself to you in, in, in how he does chooses to. He reveals himself throughout the scriptures. He reveals himself by moving, in, moving with the Holy Spirit. He reveals himself how he chooses to reveal himself. And so we need to be careful of um, when we are, when we are worshipping, and, and I'm not saying go and listen to every song and go, oh my gosh, that's theologically incorrect. Oh, we can't see. Let, let's, you know, you can go off in these tangents. When you worship, you ask yourself, where is my attention? Who am I adoring? Where's my because worship in the throne room, we saw all the creatures, everyone, the elders, everyone, they were focused on the one on the throne. So you ask yourself, where, where is my affection? And the way that we do this is to become more aware. And if you feel like you're not aware, ask him to help you to become more aware. 
It's not rock. It's not this weird, oh, it's especially for some people that are chosen by God to experience the, no. Just say, Jesus, I want to become more aware of you. I want to be more in awe of you. It's also accepting what he has said, accepting the fact that you're allowed in the throne room. Stop trying to earn your way into the throne room. Just say, thank you, Jesus, that you died in my place so that I am welcome in your throne room. Help me to be aware of you. Help me to to know. And then also agreeing with what he has said. Now, I just want to touch on um, Ursula in our worship. She's not here, so, but I have permission. So for some of you, you've seen Ursh in worship. Go crazy, jump on the stage, do crazy things. Just be, she's just in awe of this king. And I asked her to send me some of the words, the Hebrew words in the scriptures that actually speak about these different postures of worship. You see her kneeling, you see her raising her hand, you know, all these things. And the first word is yada which is in Psalm 9 verse 1, hands lifted up to God. So the scriptures speak about our hands being lifted up to God. Toda, in Psalm 9, 26 verse 7, arms lifted and extended to God. Okay, so that's another one in the scriptures. Halal, Nehemiah um, 12 verse 24, to be boastful, clamorously foolish looking. It's another word that's in the scriptures, to be boastful and clamorously foolish looking. I like that one, but then I'm worried it freaks people out. Okay, Barak, 1 Chronicles 29, 20 um, says to kneel and bow down on one or both knees. So these are all in the Bible, okay? Then, Shabak, Psalm 117, verse 1, to shout loud adoration. That's what Billy did this morning. He shouted. He just adored Jesus. Just these words of adoration to our king. Zamar, in Psalm 33, verse 2, play a stringed instrument. We've got our stringed instruments on our stage. (laughs) Tehillah, Psalm 34, verse 1, to sing with praise and adoration. So, again, why do we do these things? To help us to, either in response, in Jesus has revealed and I'm responding, to help me to have my attention on him, on the one that is on the throne, to help me to just fix my eyes and to adore him. And so you're not going to walk away here going, Okay, I've had this just from the 